We have been heading from the outset towards a transition within the development of Christianity as philosophy, and that is the transition from a base with Plato to taking Aristotle as the point of departure. At one level, the difference between Plato and Aristotle is subtle. I want to refer to that first of all. But then this subtle difference proves to have a profound impact on what it means to be not only a Christian, but also a European, ultimately an American, and finally a citizen of global society. So perhaps you'll understand that we're not going to cover all of that in this presentation. Instead, I simply want to focus on what made Aristotle innovative in his own terms, first, and then second, how that innovation proved to have a philosophically revolutionary impact within Europe in the 13th century. And if I get to the close of the 13th century today, I will be content and we can continue the investigation of the impact of the use of Aristotle in the following two weeks. So first of all, Aristotle himself and what I think of as his life problem. Aristotle's life problem was he was not an Athenian. And yet he was pursuing philosophy in Athens and indeed within Plato's own academy. In his early years, he was, as far as we can see, a faithful student of Plato, but in the way of advanced students, he began to have th thoughts of his own, of ways in which actually Plato's system might be improved. Originally, he came not from Athens, but rather from Macedonia, and as a result of that, he had an appointment as the tutor of Alexander the Great, a fine piece of work that netted him rich endowments when he wanted to found his own philosophical school, but because Alexander the Great was not popular in Athens, we call him great, they called him cruel, Aristotle himself was not named the head of Plato's academy on the death of Plato. Instead, he founded his own school in the Lyceum, as it was called. He had the wherewithal to do that, but he also had a degree of makeup to do. And so he did, and he did so with a renovation of Plato's entire understanding of the purpose of human life, which you can see summed up in the first entry within Aristotle's ethics. And what I'm concerned to bring out here is the way in which he both subsumes many of the perspectives of Plato and yet also places them within a fresh setting altogether. He writes, if happiness is activity in accordance with virtue, it is reasonable that it should be in accordance with the highest virtue. And this will be that of the best thing in man, whether it be reason or something else that this element is, which is thought to be our natural ruler and guide, and to take thought of things noble and divine, whether it be itself also divine or only the most divine element in us, the activity of this in accordance with its proper virtue will be perfect happiness. That this activity is contemplative we have already said. Contemplation 
is the highest good. Activity as we normally think of it, that is, acting with a purpose which is commendable, which is excellent, which brings in itself the Greek virtue of arete. Virtue pursued is good activity, but the greatest activity is the contemplation of what is good. Because then there is no separation between the one who contemplates and the good which is its target. When you understand happiness in this fashion, which Aristotle clearly does, you can see he was indeed a student of Plato's. He also sees insight as being the purpose of human being and insight as conveying what will make you your happiest. It's the reason for which a scholar is a scholar. A scholar is a, per a person who has schole, leisure. A person who is wise uses his schole, his leisure, for contemplation. Because that is the highest form of happiness. Neither Plato nor Aristotle could ever have invented golf. For them, it is rather the exercise of insight which brings this happiness. So to this extent, Aristotle is developing the perspective of Plato himself. But he's also adjusting it in a signal way. And it is over this issue of contemplation in particular. As we've seen repeatedly over the past couple of weeks, for Plato, when you perceive in the setting in which you presently live, the act of insight does not go from you to whatever the object of your perception is. Instead, there is a communication between you and the ideal form that corresponds to that object, right? The basic platonic dichotomy between the ideal, which is also held to be the only reality, and the material, which is held to be at best a poor copy of the ideal. So whenever you or I perceive what we perceive is not the reality we achieve. There is all, always a distant relationship between perception and contemplation. And in Plato, the fact that you have that distance permits Plato to be the full robust idealist that he is. That's exactly what Aristotle challenges. And this is the center of the Aristotelian system in contrast to the Platonic. In Plato's understanding, when you perceive, that which is perceived is itself real. That truly exists. Whether what you perceive is a physical object See, in Plato's system, when you perceive a table, you're not perceiving the table. You are perceiving certain inchoate matter, and your mind makes the connection between the ideal form of table and that particular perception. Not in Aristotle. In Aristotle, the ideal and the material are together from the very beginning. Substance, that reality, and physical existence have already been combined. There is a principle of causation within the universe, according to Aristotle, which brings together both design and material 
in single entities. And he believes that this analysis can be applied to physical reality, and that's what makes him a robust contributor within the field of what he calls natural philosophy and what we would call science. By which he meant not experimental work, but the development of categories that permits us to see the classification of causes in our natural environment, whether plant or animal. Many of the taxonomies used in the development of the history of biology take their point of departure in Aristotle. And in his understanding that physical reality itself embodies a form of design and purpose. Now why should this have proven a revolutionary thought in 13th century Europe? To some extent because 13th century Europe had not been reading Aristotle. The withdrawal of the Roman Empire from the West towards the East, not only in moving its capital from Rome to Constantinople, but also in placing all of its major military resources along its borders of confrontation to the East, and along with placing its commercial operations in the East as well, meant that Europe was quite simply a backwater of the Roman Empire ceased to have the kind of importance that it once did. People in Europe were not even reading Greek. I rest my case. Only two works of Aristotle had been translated into Latin, and they were translated sporadically within the compendia of scholastic works of the people called the schoolmen, but they were not analyzed. Also, there had been a tendency because of the Neoplatonism of early Christianity that we refer to several times now already, to take Aristotle and to patch him into Plato, not to understand the significance of this distinction of whether the material and the ideal are going to be distanced, as in Plato, or combined, as in Aristotle. Well, presumably, Europe could quite happily have got along on that basis. You can live without reading philosophy, without considering Aristotle. But then the Crusades happened. And the Crusades forced Europe to see something which it might have noticed earlier, but they had firsthand acquaintance with it. Islam was a superior culture. They built better, they fought better, which is why the West lost the Crusades. They had better sanitation. They could predict the movement of the stars as was thought at the time, more accurately than could be done in the West, they could count better. Their hygiene was improved. They had better centers of learning. Baghdad was a center of global culture in its time and would remain so until 1258 when, tragically, it was destroyed by Hulagu Khan in one of the great disasters for Islamic civilization and I would say also for global culture. But for centuries before that, the Crusades had brought Europe into contact with this culture. And you had to wonder what would be the philosophical underpinnings of a culture so clearly advanced as compared to Europe. And the answer was Aristotle. That Muslim theologians had for years been engaged with Aristotle for a straightforward reason. In its early centuries, 
Islamic theologians had experimented with the use of Plato. And the reason for that is, as we've already seen, everyone experiments with Plato. He is a highly visible philosopher in the Greek tradition. By the time of the rise of Islam, his works had been widely disseminated. But there's a difficulty with Plato. We have already seen this in our earlier discussions. Namely, Plato can find within the system no reason for there to be any connection between the ideal and the material. That was the very reason for which you have various Neoplatonic attempts to address that problem. This difficulty was perceived even more clearly within the environment of Islam, and it also, to Muslim theologians, raised a dreadful problem. Namely, the whole basis of Islam is its fully consistent monotheism. It constantly projects God as being the sole and sufficient cause of the entire universe in any particular idiom. How then would it be possible to conceive of matter as somehow not falling within the purview of God in the same way that ideal forms do? There must be an inherent dualism in a platonic view of reality that makes it unattractive to Muslim thinkers. But for that very reason, Aristotle is overwhelmingly favorable from the point of view of an attempt to construct a comprehensive perspective of all reality from the point of view of Islam. And these works became known in the West. Probably the most influential one from the point of view of Thomas Aquinas, to whom we're about to turn, is that of a Muslim theologian from the previous century who even lived fairly near to Thomas Aquinas. He lived in present-day Spain, Al-Andalus. He was brought up in Cordova. His name is Ibn Rushd, and by the miracle of the benighted Middle Ages, he becomes known as Averroes. I don't even guess how that occurred. But Ibn Rushd wrote a commentary on all the metaphysics of Aristotle from the point of view of the Quran and early Muslim tradition. In order to make out the case that this is the way in which God can be understood to be the sole cause of the entire universe. And the reason God can be understood as sole cause is that when Aristotle thinks of cause, he thinks of this across a broad spectrum. It includes providing the material of a phenomenon. It includes having the design of that phenomenon. It includes the immediate production, the efficient cause of phenomenon. And finally, it also includes the purpose of the phenomenon. Causation is always, in Aristotle and in Ibn Rushd, fourfold. So God, therefore, constantly operates on these different levels in order to produce phenomena, which can also be complex because causation is not simply one billiard ball hitting another. It's also how you made the balls, what they're made out of, and what the whole game is. All that is brought together within an Aristotelian understanding of causation. And he also believes that human beings have got the capacity to understand causation in this complex sense. Uh, this he goes on to say, this is the second entry in 
his politics. This is just after the famous statement that he refers to people as political animals. He goes on and fills out what he means by that in what follows. Now that man is more of a political animal than bees, that means really political, because you know how bees buzz and sting. More political animal than bees or any other gregarious animals is evident. Nature, as we often say, makes nothing in vain. And man is the only animal whom she is endowed with the gift of speech. And whereas mere voice is but an indication of pleasure or of pain, and therefore found in other animals, for their nature attains to the perception of pleasure and pain, and the intimation of them to one another, and no further, the power of speech is intended to set forth the expedient and inexpedient, and therefore likewise the just and the unjust. The power of speech correctly harnessed in accurate perception leads the individual and for Aristotle even leads the state to an understanding of what the highest virtue might be. So that the combination of this insight will lead to a truly global understanding of human purpose. As Aristotle writes for Alexander the Great, and as Aristotle is picked up by Ibn Rushd for Islam, and will be picked up by Thomas Aquinas, the design is for an understanding not only of the physical universe, but also of law, of what is right and what is wrong, of what it means to be a human, with the result that Aristotle goes on to ask about the best form of government in order to achieve this aim of a comprehensive perspective. And he writes in the third uh, insert on page one, the principle that the multitude ought to be supreme rather than the few best is one that is maintained, though not free from difficulty seems to contain an element of truth. By this he means every person has an insight into what is good because every person has the capacity of intellect and because there's a lot of good out there. In this, Aristotle is actually more optimistic than Plato. What you perceive is inherently good. Therefore, the accuracy of your perception is what's going to be in question. But that also causes him to go in a different direction within this same paragraph and to go on to say, because not everyone is trained in perception, it really isn't suitable to put the multitude in charge of the state. It might result in their making foolish choices. Who knows? They might elect a reality TV star to be president. Now we ask the question, how we relate this understanding of Aristotle to Thomas Aquinas, who's just on the next page. And here, what Thomas needs to do is answer objections to what he's doing at his own University of Paris, which is where he was active because there are many people within the 13th century who believe that the use of Aristotle is at best risky and at worst heretical. Why? The characterization that Aristotle makes of God as being the prime cause within those principles of causation I referred to appears to be an entirely abstract and apersonal depiction of God. In addition, if you decide that we are going to jettison Plato in his distinction between the ideal and the material, 
aren't you at the same time jettisoning little ideas like heaven? Hell? Where is the room for the conception that there is something about us which is not grasped by physical reality? Thomas Aquinas had to face severe objections. Some years in which he was working, he was unable to get access to the works of Aristotle because they had actually been banned. People were not to read them. Owing to their challenge, of the ambient Platonism of traditional Christianity that we have already discussed. Thomas would only be named as the premier theologian of Roman Catholicism during the 16th century. That, even in academia, is a long time to wait for tenure. And we'll discuss next week why that occurs, why it is he actually became much more influential after his death. But first, what I want to emphasize is that he has to work this out against serious, potentially deadly opposition. Why does he do that? I would suggest it's because he has the example of even Rushid Averroes before him and can see that the intellectual attainment of a genuinely comprehensive philosophy is fully worth this risk. In working out the system, he also bears in mind the particular criticisms that he had to face at the University of Paris. And you can see some of these in the quotations on page two. He begins with an understanding of how it is we can know anything. And in this regard, he shows himself thoroughly Aristotelian in his perspective that you know what you perceive. That's your point of departure. And so he writes, since all the knowledge that a person has about a thing is based on his understanding of its substance, according to the philosopher, the basis of any argument is what a thing is, the way the substance of a thing is understood must determine what is known about it. Let me just observe that Thomas takes it that you will know the substance of a thing by perception, an emphatically non-Platonic thought. And also, when he ever he says the philosopher, he means Aristotle. He refers to Aristotle as the philosopher in the same way he refers to St. Paul as the apostle. He takes these as simply being key authorities within his discussion. And then he goes on, thus, if the human intellect comprehends the substance, say, a stone or triangle, no intelligible aspect of that thing is beyond the capacity of human reason. It is that and only that, and we can know it fully. Nothing escapes our notice if we perceive accurately. Then he has to remember his detractors who argue that if you look at matters that way, you'll wind up defining God out of existence. Therefore, he pursues his thought. However, this is not the case for us with God. The human intellect cannot achieve the understanding of God's substance by means of its natural capacity because in this life, all knowledge that is in our intellects originates in the senses. So we can only know by means of our senses what we know we indeed possess as knowledge but this does not include any form of substance which is also not a matter of what we can perceive. He introduces the distinction which become fundamental for him and fundamental for many, many forms of religious discourse since this time, the distinction between intellect and faith the understanding that there are ways in which you can know a substance by means of the intellect, 
that is sensory perception, and ways in which you can know of a substance by means of faith. These two, in his argument, are complementary because the causation of them both is the same, but faith and knowledge are inherently different according to Thomas Aquinas. That distinction had not been made prior to him. So, for example, the rather fashionable belief that one can know God without knowing much of anything is derived with the notion that faith needs to be seen as something distinct from knowledge, comes as a part of the adjustment that Thomas Aquinas is making. But he also sees it as a matter of human anthropology, anthropology, not theology, but a matter of human anthropology that both by means of reason and by means of faith, people can only be satisfied when they have an understanding of God. And in, as I read this, I want you to bear in mind that first quotation we had from Aristotle about happiness. What you see is going on here is that Aquinas is about to take happiness in Aristotle and make it into the vision of God. And so he writes in the second quotation, because men wondered about the underlying causes of what they saw, they first began to philosophize. And when they found the cause, they were satisfied. Human inquiry does not cease until it comes to the first cause. And we think we have full knowledge when we know the first cause. Therefore, man desires by nature to know the first cause as his ultimate end. But the first cause of everything is God. Therefore, man's ultimate end is to know God. Now, what's occurred in this? What's happened is that Thomas Aquinas has taken the method of the schoolmen that I referred to earlier, where you make logical deduction on the basis of sources that you cite, and he's put that together with the Aristotelian view of happiness to provide the understanding that what he is talking about is not simply an organization of doctrine for Christianity. He's talking about the nature of humanity as such. And therefore, the purpose of its organization in Europe as a whole. His vision of this organization must come from some source which will put together the element of knowledge that comes from intellect and familiarity of God that comes from faith. Where would that be except in the papacy? where you can have a combination of the two kinds of human activity in quest of God. Because in the end, any human society, again, he's read as Aristotle, any human society can only be as good as the virtue that it attains to. And there should be a coordination with democracy kept carefully in check in order to achieve those ends. And so, in his last statement, you can see him coming to his overall argument about the necessity of a united Europe. Enough to bring on the Brexit earlier, I would have thought. A united Europe with a single purpose, which also has within it the seed of an idea I want to pursue next time. So, he writes, whenever things are ordered to some end, they are subject to the direction of the one who is principally concerned with that end. Thus, all the parts and activities of an army are directed as their ultimate end to the goal in general, which is victory. And therefore, the general commands the whole army. 
In the same way, an art which is concerned with an end controls and lays down rules for an art which is concerned with the means to an end. The art of government directs the military. The military art, a cavalry. And navigation, shipbuilding. Something important to recognize in Thomas and in Aristotle is purpose is a cause. Purpose is not simply a result. Purpose is actually embedded in phenomena. Purpose is there as much as design, as much as the material as the phenomenon, as much as the immediate provocations of the phenomenon. Purpose is always present as a cause. Therefore, and this is the stunning consequence of that, since all things are ordered to the divine goodness as to the end, God, who is that goodness, substantially possessed and known and loved, must be the one who governs all things. Now, there are two vital elements in this contention that Thomas was making, a contention which was influential in its time and only grew in influence. One is, we really ought to be organized into a united organism. The state ought to be coordinated to a clearly noble end, the best end that we can possibly imagine. Anything less than that will defeat our nature. But the other is that because purpose is implicit in phenomena as their basic cause, it means that purpose actually defines what happens in all of the phenomena leading up to that end. If it's true that my purpose, to take his example, in fighting a war is to get victory, then everything that occurred along the chain of events leading up to that victory substantiated that purpose and that purpose permeated those events. All human actions are actually directed towards a purpose which humans only imperfectly understand but we know they must have a purpose, and that purpose would only be understood by God. God knows, therefore, whether each of us ultimately is to be saved or damned. If you believe in the singularity of cause, and if you believe that purpose is embedded in that cause, predestination follows out as a logical consequence. Next week, we'll see John Calvin took this very seriously. And that in that regard, he also was anticipated by Muslim thinkers. But that we'll turn to next week, as I say. Thank you for coming. As Fred says, I'm happy to take questions or comments. I can't say that Thomas Aquinas is my favorite theologian, but I think he's the clearest that I'm aware of. I sort of enjoy the logical structure. Yes, please, Tess. Excellent. The question which I'll repeat for the Cardinal from Red Hook uh, is, is Thomas Aquinas responsible for the emphasis of the Roman Catholic Church on not questioning faith? And I think the answer for that must be yes, although 
I'll qualify it before I give the full-throated yes, but in the end, it will be affirmative. Clearly, there has always been an understanding within Christian tradition that being smart doesn't guarantee you salvation, and that an understanding of the ways of God doesn't mean that you necessarily cooperate with the ways of God. And also that people who do philosophy might be inclined to be, oh, let's say, not sufficiently humble. All right? So I think there has always been an acknowledgement, and perhaps Christianity has had more of that element of skepticism about learning uh, than have other religions because, after all, a principle has been that whoever wants to be the greatest in this tradition should be the least. So I wouldn't wish to say that Thomas uh, Aquinas was inventing something which was whole cloth new. On the other hand, having given the qualification, I would say that, for example, uh, he uses the phrase invincible ignorance. By invincible ignorance, what he means is that the people who he is aware of are believers in medieval Europe. Most of them can't read. Most of them have had no substantial exposure to the Bible, have the most rudimentary understanding of even the elements of the Christian tradition. But he believes their ignorance is invincible because it is salvific, because their faith brings about a familiarity with God's substance, as he says. In most other things, that wouldn't work. Uh, you cannot become a good physicist by faith because you're either measuring correctly or you're not. Your perception has to be trained. However, in the case of divine substance, because divine substance is not instantiated in matter, therefore that substance is something you become aware of by means of faith. Therefore, it becomes appropriate for the teaching authority, what's called the magisterium, it becomes appropriate, therefore, for the magisterium of the church to explain to you as the believer who may not understand the contents of faith and probably will never understand those contents, to explain to you what you need to believe in order to have this faith so that in effect you begin saying faith is now not going to be defined as the way in which a person responds to God in confidence. That's the biblical understanding. The biblical understanding is a person has faith because in that instance, the person places trust in God. There is no substantial difference in Hebrew or in Greek between having faith and having trust. The terms interpenetrate with one another. There refers to a relational uh, interaction between a particular person and God, or a prophet or Jesus, whoever is concerned. But when I say actually faith is not relational, Faith is rather a manner of a specific understanding of divine substance. Then I can tell you what you need to believe to have that faith, and I can tell you you need to believe that for you to be saved. That is the Council of Trent. That's, that's exactly what happens at the Council of Trent uh, in the 16th century. It's a response to John Calvin and therefore we'll get into it further next week. But part of the response to John Calvin is to say, unlike what you say, and unlike what Martin Luther has to say, the faith that saves you is not your personal relationship to God. 
but is rather what the church tells you you must believe to have faith. And that same Council of Trent elevates Thomas Aquinas, who had been considered a radical, into the premier theologian of Roman Catholicism. So yes, it's a superb question. And it is the source of that, within the modern period, still existing option of seeing the term faith as referring to a body of doctrine a person must believe in order to be saved. And this is, relatively speaking, a recent development. I mean, for me, anything since the Reformation is like yesterday. So it seems to me that we're dealing with really quite an innovative understanding. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Yeah, as we go with reason and faith, so we have to make a connection in Aquinas uh, between nature and grace. Uh, that is, intellect, reason, functions in the world of nature. And so he believes that anything that you do in nature uh, should be guided by your reason. And if it is, you're going to prosper. In the world of grace, however, because grace refers to the way in which God is willing to disclose God's self despite not being in nature. So that God will, in fact, often sporadically, but sometimes, sometimes with regularity in things we call sacraments, but either sporadically or sacramentally, God's grace will become evident to the believer. The believer. God's grace does not become evident to general reason, but it does become evident to the believer. So that for that believer, reason and faith, nature and grace, go together. That's what we hope will be the case. We would like believers to be learned, though we know they all aren't. We would like learned people to be believers, but we know they all are, are not all that way. And we have to confront the issue, which Thomas does. We have to confront the issue, given that God wills nature and grace to be combined, faith and reason to belong together, but that also people do not behave as if that were the case. How can we organize a just society? And his answer is, we must have rulers who understand that these things belong together. And if that means disciplining people of learning who are not believers, and if it means getting believers who are a little bit undereducated back up the snuff, that's what we will do. Because as Thomas Aquinas understands it, that represents a part of our purpose as a society. If we didn't do that, we would be letting absolutely everyone down as a consequence. So it's a good question, but it's also one that reveals, when you see how Thomas Aquinas addresses that question, it reveals that the apparently very inclusive statement, faith and reason belong together, actually has a severe consequence. They belong together, and therefore, if they're not together in your mind, there is something wrong with you. There's not something wrong with that order of society, which in fact reflects the will of God in developing every single human being to the point where the vision of God becomes possible. The vision of God, 
when taken as the purpose of a state, has within it exactly the tendencies that we associate with oppression. Not because it is attempting to oppress, but because it will not give up on its purpose for every member of its society. Thomas Aquinas was attempting to organize a kind of medieval utopia where everyone would be living as if for this purpose and if they did not, where their behavior would at least be appropriately contained so that it would not interrupt the purpose of the whole. Neither Aristotle nor Thomas Aquinas were pacifists. Pacifists. They both understood that it would be necessary for the state to go to war. They both took it as a matter of course that war could be just. And they never believed that the state should forego forceful means inside its own borders. We haven't had any Quakers yet. And that is still very distant on the horizon of any kind of Christian philosophy in the 13th century. Yes? The question is, what would Thomas Aquinas think of the church today? What would he say of the church today? And I suppose he would say, oh dear. <laughs> that is, his vision was that you would have places of academic reflection where the development of theology would immediately have an influence on the church. In places like, oh, say the University of Paris. Now, I say the University of Paris, but the fact is, at the time, University of Bologna was older and bigger. Oxford and Cambridge had been around for some time. But he's very much a Parisian kind of Dominican. And so he was anticipating that there would be a lively discourse between the way in which the church is constructed and genuinely cutting edge theology. That does not much happen at the moment. At the moment, there's a tendency for the church to behave as if theology were an entirely different enterprise. In addition, of course, Aquinas assumes that the church would have a degree of genuine power on the ground. Uh, the idea of the nation state is not one that appealed to Thomas Aquinas, not as a sovereign entity. Because if you have sovereign nation states, they, in his fear, would go off in their different directions and you would totally lose the coherence of Christendom. I mean, he is operating with a conception of Christendom, that is, all of Europe, in principle, at a degree of unity, and in which, as we've already seen, democracy is not taken as being something you particularly wish to encourage. Democracy is fine, but you want to keep it in check. You want to make sure that you never lose sight of the purpose as a whole. So his view of the church, I think, would be one at the moment of great disappointment on several levels. <laughs>